to share with apple pie than curry. So I interpreted that as saying I'm more American than British because curry is now the national dish oh, yeah. of England, not of India, by the way. Uh, so I will now open this without further discussions to questions. Uh, I already see one hand. Uh, go ahead. It's a very interesting question. The, the lady is asking what is the threshold for reporting an act which can be interpreted as a hateful act? Or, or for example, I mean this is actually under discussion, right? When is a crime a hate crime and when it is not a hate crime? So she's asking when is it, when do, what is the level at, after which we should report the crime? I'm going to try and answer that. It, it's actually a complex issue uh, because it, it depends on the individual and the level that the situation rises to. So did I come up there? I can come up there. That's easier. Sorry. I'll take that. Thanks. Sorry about that. So the 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 question. Uh, as I understand it is, you know, when, when is this a crime and when is it a hate crime? And a lot of times what that really boils down to is, are you as an individual uh, afraid because you have a right to feel safe in your home? And if someone's knocking on your door, you know, and it's Halloween, that's not a crime. They're, they're probably trick-or-treating or something. But if a child is, knows that you're Muslim or Indian or anything, and uh, it's not a child, maybe it's a, a, just a neighbor, just leave it as anyone. And they're knocking on your door every day and, it, and, and you feel afraid, that is something you should let us know. Because if it's something that can escalate, uh, we, we're gonna wanna be able to say, yes, this began here and it wasn't a crime then, but it has migrated into a crime. Certainly other crimes, they're fair on their face. They're easy to identify. If someone throws a brick through your window, this is a crime. That's a property crime and could very easily say if there were a note taped to the brick that said we don't want you living here, that's a hate crime. I mean, we have answered many hate crimes in regards to people that have left. We've dealt with burning crosses. I mean, that's a very, very obvious hate crime. We've dealt with people putting swastikas on the, on the garage door of a Jewish family. I mean, that is a very extreme hate crime, and they need to be tracked and reported. I don't know if that answers it perfectly, so if you have a... And just a follow-up, I'm, I'm thinking like when we're out and you, you're, you're driving in your car and you're stopped and somebody's beating you and they beat you up, and then you'll start screaming at you. You have the right like everyone else to call 911 if you're in fear or you're being intimidated you have the right to report i mean it's difficult you know i'm hi i'm, I'm rolling down i-95 at 70 miles an hour but let's say someone was actually following you after they were yelling at you you really should report that and if it turns out to be nothing and it was coincidental we'll figure that out that's our job that's our responsibility but if it's it, it, it turns out you think well i don't want to bother the police which is what we're there for please bother us that's, that's why we exist. Uh, we want to come to help folks, but we, we're not omniscient. We need to know where you are and what's wrong. So report it. We'll figure it out. If, it, if it's, if it's uh, innocuous and it's nothing, then it's nothing. But if it's something and you don't call and they follow you to your home where your family is, not to scare you, but that's significant and that's dangerous. Let us do our jobs. I, I hope that's the, uh, uh, well enough answer. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just want to share with you that, uh, you know, we have a very beautiful bridge uh, right uh, in the north, and a lot of people who travel on that bridge stop to take pictures of that bridge. And when Muslims stop and take pictures of that bridge, people who are driving by call in. And the FBI, by law, is required to check it out. So one of the things that I think the FBI probably has one dedicated person whose daily job is to go and check the bridge because some Muslims stopped to take a photograph on that bridge. So what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, 
Who knows, one of those persons could be doing something maybe in 100 years, right? But I've been hearing this from the FBI for the last five years, and, and they say, well, we have to do it, it's the law required. So some part of law, uh, law or peacekeeping is due diligence, and you know, non-events are the best things. Non-events are the best things. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I wanted to say something. Sure, sure. I, uh, on hate crimes, um, there are state laws and there are federal laws. And so with the state or in the county stuff, Colonel Setting will investigate. And on the federal side, it will be the FBI that will, unfortunately they're not here today, they can elaborate a little more on that. So when you um, report, they'll talk to each other and they'll be coordinated and uh, how they have they move forward and what have you. But the key thing is I want to say is that the, there are nuances in the hate crimes law and what have you, and at a later time we can probably sit down with the organizers and try to organize, or even at your mosque, bring the, uh, the panelists to your, uh, your religious centers to talk about hate crimes and distinguish, distinguishing bias crimes and hate crimes and going from there, because they're all subtle nuances. But at the end of the day, I would say report. I, uh, you know, I am, you know, I'm walking down the street the other day and um, this man rolls down his window and says, Osama, go home. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at him thinking, you know, on a good day, I'm 5'6", you know, with my turban, I'm about 5'8", and Osama was like 6'6", six, six, you know, and everything. <laughs> and I was like, man, you blind or something. But anyways, I didn't report that because I knew that guy was crazy. But I mean, if it was, but if you feel unsafe, I stress that you report. Please, I mean, um, don't overlook it. And I know the, this is another thing I forgot to mention. In our cultures, talking to police, where we've come from, is like, well, no, that's going to be more of a hassle. In South Asian cultures and uh, in Asia, we need to overcome that because law enforcement here is to, here to assist you. And so that's what their goal and um, uh, program is, is to assist you. So I encourage you to report. Questions? More questions? Yes, go ahead. Yes. 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 There's a First Amendment, but also. So if I felt fearful, so he uh, drove by and just yelled at me, drove off. But if I felt fearful, I was walking to a federal, like I was walking to a police department, yeah, and everything. So uh, in that case, um, I told where I was going. That's a good point. I told the people I was meeting that this has just happened to me, and I'm, we discussed the issue and everything else like that. But. I did not, in that case, it's a very good point, um, I didn't feel fear for my life. Now, if that person had rolled down the window and said more things and stopped his car and then he got out of it, then, you know, I'd be running as fast as I could and I could kind of have 911. It's on, again, what, in, in this case, uh, as the Colonel has said, how fearful you fear, uh, what kind of state of fear you feel, and it's on you to uh, report. I just encourage that if you if you feel that you're in fear of your uh, safety, then definitely you report. I think you should have died asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there are a couple of comments I want to make. Good point. Uh, because uh, I will take these two questions before I end. Uh, we are going to stop in five or six more minutes, and after that, we have the afternoon prayers uh, where we pray that. The Zohar, we will pray the Asr prayer there. And then please come back here at 3 o'clock for our political uh, politics and justice panel. Uh, and uh, make sure that you come back quickly and don't linger outside. Uh, the, the two questions before I take this, well, I'll take those two questions and make the comments. Go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you so much for what you do every day. Um, it sounds like you're making very commendable efforts for intercultural dialogue and for um, my question was, how are you going about identifying who the leaders of the communities are? 
Are you simply going to, like the imams of the mosques, or how do you decide who the key people to speak with are? I'll take the second question. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned about the Justice Department. Uh, how can people contact uh, and how can we contact your outreach uh, section of the Justice Department? And I think uh, I commend all of you for being here, and I think we need more of these uh, sessions to change the climate that is being created by the media, by the alien form, by the people who don't know. As you mentioned, when they talk to you, you're different than just looking at you. So I think we should do more of these. Thank you. So the second part, I think we can provide uh, information about all the panelists and also other phone numbers. Uh, and we will make sure that, uh, Navid, are you listening to me? We will make sure that these phone numbers of, are sent to all the other mosques and other community centers uh, and even halal meat stores, et cetera, in, 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 the, in the area. Uh, would you like to take the yeah. first question? Yes. Me, or, uh, Colonel Fetter. You want me yeah. to answer that question? Or okay. Tom? <laughs> How do you, you know, the better person to answer it is, is our county executive. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the answer to the question is, is really, we relied greatly on the relationship that the county executive had built with the Muslim uh, community. He actually, it was his idea to do the outreach. We as a police department do outreach all the time because this is what we're always trying to do. We had to respond to the Jewish Community Center and we had to uh, identify the folks that ran that center and explain to them that unfortunately, because of people that are misguided and misunderstood that they were in fact a target for possible terrorism. And in doing that, we established a relationship. At that point, our county executive said, you know, I, I know the great leaders of the Muslim community, and I think we should do the exact same thing with them. And, I, and I'm just a big fan of, of stealing good ideas. So I stole the county executive's idea and met, met, met with, he and I met with the, the, the folks that he had already identified, and they, they, as by default, they were leaders in their community. But we did extend the invitation to them for them to identify others that would be interested in having an open bridge of communication. And I will say that when the homicide did occur in Delaware, inside the Muslim community, we were able to abate everyone's fears that it was a hate crime. We were able to explain to the leaders of that community immediately calling an emergency meeting at police headquarters. Because once something's happened, it's too late to build a relationship. It's already occurred. It's, it's, you missed your opportunity. When we had established a relationship, something bad happened, we were able to identify it and t tell them the truth as to what happened in a private meeting, no understanding that they were being held at a certain level of confidentiality, and they were able to calm and quell an entire community of somewhere over 8,000 people that were very concerned. So I think we have identified the best ones. I didn't have a particular scientific method. I just trusted my county executive. <laughs> Now, there, there's levels of leaders. What the first group is, and when it happens, I believe it's going to happen. We had to identify a number, I think seven or eight, and you could argue over who they are, that are vetted. They come right into the command center, and they help us determine the response. But, but sitting here thinking, um, we're revising our website. We could put on there. Um, for the Muslim community, because it is going to be the Muslim community in the next year that I believe we're dealing with. Um, cases like yours, where you can come on and tell what happened, we can do a background on your license plate, and we'll put that out to everybody. So there'll be a, what we may call it hate crime or something, reporting. And where you're not sure you want a car to come, but you want to know you have a tag number of somebody just, uh, you know, made a comment so that we can begin to track the amount of hatred that we're seeing and that's a real possibility but in terms of uh how you expand your leadership uh it was said earlier we i was at a, a, a mosque two weeks ago we'll come out as often as you want and speak but the real need is to be able to have dr khan call the staff and say this is serious what can we do not in, not in the emergency that I'm talking about where something occurs and within 15 minutes they're in the 911 center. Well, you know, somebody's knocking on my mother's door once a week, chief, what are you gonna do about it? That's, we need to have that and we're beginning to develop that with the command staff. That's not a, 
typical 911 call where you don't know who's going to show up and that officer takes a report. We need to have those leaders that can identify my daughter's been followed home two days in a row. I need to get a hold of somebody in that police department to get a plainclothes detective over there. And we're still working on that. If you've got any ideas, you can, you can tell us who all the uh, people that you've identified. Mohammed here is working for us too. Uh, who's identified that, that we can start with? And if you want to add to that list, uh, we can add to that list. Um, the, the 911 center can only have so many people that can be there in 15 minutes, but I think we're up to seven or eight. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to make two, two more comments. Like, for example, the question on uh, the leadership thing. One of the, one of the reasons why we have such a good relationship with the police department is because of Tom. Tom reached out to the Muslim community even before he became the county executive. So we know him from before he, he began his campaign. Uh, but you must also understand that the American Muslim community or Delaware Muslim community is not a political unit with elected leaders. It depends on leaders in the community who take initiative. So for example, today we have the governor and congressman and the senator and Tom Carter and the police here. Now, those Muslims who came here today will be able to get their cards, will be able to interact with them, know them, get their phone number. If you were sitting at home watching TV or some football match between Turkey and somebody at home and didn't show up today, then you can't complain that you're left out of the loop. Uh, we are not going to come to your house and then say, you are our leader, so please come and meet us. So Muslims have to come out and be more engaged with the system before they are able to become part of the system, and that's very important. Uh, there are two things that's going on. People who are from the immigrant Muslims tend to be very wary of the police forces and authority, and the other part of our community, which is African-American Muslim community, does not have historically good relations with the law enforcement agency. But in our part of the world, we have this opportunity to have better relations. So I'm going to stop with that. We'll break for prayer, and please come back at 3 o'clock sharp back into this panel for the next panel. And I want to thank everybody very much. Thank you.